we'll leave the doors open to let the air flow through. Okay, <laughs> the hot air. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, how are you doing, Danny? I'm a professional dresser and a professional vice chancellor here at the University of Glasgow. Um, thanks for coming on to, to hear this lecture from our eminent guest, uh, Professor John Goddard, OBE. Uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction because you're here to listen to him, not to listen to me, but it would be remiss of me to not to point out some of the things that uh, uh, he's been successful in and uh, I presume will be part of uh, his, his lecture at the Civic University in the city. Uh, most importantly at the moment, he's a deputy chair of the Civic University Commission. He's been doing some, some good work in trying to up the, uh, the civic engagement of uh, universities across the UK. Uh, he's a former deputy vice chancellor at Newcastle University, but now has the wonderful title of Emeritus Professor of Regional Development Studies. Uh, he's, he's a founder and a former leader of Newcastle's Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies. And I think across the UK, Newcastle has had a reputation for being a civically engaged university. So looking forward to hear, I'm going to link back to what's happening in Newcastle. I, I guess you're not going to forget about Newcastle at all in your lecture here. Glasgow is a good city as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> And he's worked all over the world, uh, including in Ireland, Finland, the Netherlands, and Iraq. Uh, he was awarded OBE in 1986, uh, and is a graduate, both of uh, PhD and uh, he's a PhD from LSE. So, a very eminent speaker. I'm sure we'll have a, 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 great, uh, a great lecture. And are we going to have some questions at the end? Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, John. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, just a little bit more about my, 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 my biography, in a way, which is relevant to the, the topic. Um, I mean, I was an academic working in, in a multidisciplinary research centre on urban and regional development. Um, Kurds had its origin uh, as a sort of spatial spy science policy research unit in, in, in Sussex, um, where we tried to think that innovation had a spatial dimension to it. You need to think about innovation as occurring in places. Um, and we did a lot of work on that. We backed into the university as a source of innovation in our academic work and policy work. And then something really changed in the early uh, 90s when there was um, a, a commission um, on, uh, on, the, the, on the universities um, and um, the Lord Deering Review in 1996. And the Civic University, the um, Committee of Vice Chancellors and Principals, CVCP, which is a predecessor for what's now called UUK, or in brackets, Universities Are Us, um, the, uh, that organisation came to us and said, Will you do a piece of work for input to the, um, to the, to the uh, Deering Review? on universities and communities. So we had 10 people working on this, auditing what was going on. This is 20, 20 years, no, more than 30 years ago, on the civic role of universities. Um, most of that went into the Deering Review uh, as an input, and Deering took it on board and had a whole chapter of his report, but many of his recommendations were not adopted. Um, and, and so that, the whole thing sort of went on the back burner. And then subsequently in 2000, we had a new VC in Newcastle, saw what we were doing, um, and he said, I want you to come from being a research centre director to become my DVC to translate some of your academic stuff into the practice of my university. So I went for, ten, I worked for 10 years um, doing, turning the theory and the policy stuff into practice um, at Newcastle with a new DVC, including setting up Newcastle as a science city, which came out of conversations we had with Gordon Brown when he was Chancellor. Um, and so we did a lot of work. Um, and then I retired in 2008 when I was 65 um, and, and then went back into the academy um, doing academic work and research um, and policy and practice on all of that sort of stuff. And I'm going to share with you some of my insights from that more recent period. But I would say in the context of impact, I could have not written the stuff I was, have written in books if I hadn't in practice done it. So I learned from doing. So this whole process by which the academy moves backwards and forwards between the world of thought and action uh, is pretty, pretty important. Um, okay, I'm going to go through a lot of stuff. And just, if you want to find out what I'm saying and, and you want to read it, um, this is quite that link there, QS World Wow News. QS is the, rank, the global ranking systems of universities. Um, uh, you know that ranking system, lead tables and all the rest of it. Um, out of the blue, they phoned me up and said they're, they're going around the world 
and everywhere they're going doing these, collecting this data, everyone's talking about the civic university. How do universities uh, re-engage with their communities is a global issue. Uh, and QS, and a, basically, everything I'm going to say is in a much more easy to assume if you want to go onto that link, and it's in a glossy magazine as well, which will be in, in the VC's office. And the other thing I just should say, but why, uh, reason, partly why I'm here, I, and this is a global issue, I spoke on a platform in uh, Torino with Anton Mascatelli. Um, it was a conference on universities and cities, there are a lot of these conferences around the world which bring together, this one was a European network of mayors of cities and uh, vice chancellors or rectors of European universities. Um, and I was the, uh, the in-between, the bridge between those two worlds. Um, and so out of that I discussed with Anton whether we can establish some sharing experience. So that's part of the reason I, I'm here. So what I'm going to talk about is a lot of stuff here and I'm going to go quite fast. Um, the, the, looking at the research and policy and practice communities, the notion of universities as urban anchor institutions, and there are a lot of tensions in this uh, between the, t the academic world and the city and regional development world. And think about the notion of the role of universities in the development of cities, not just the university in the city, but in the development of the city. And my experience in my research is when I go and talk to local authorities and universities, I've done a lot of work around the world, uh, the OECD and the European Commission, by and large, the outside world doesn't understand universities, they're black boxes, uh, and the two worlds pass each other like ships in the night. By and large, public authorities, uh, municipalities don't understand universities, by and large, most universities don't understand the, uh, the cities and local government. And that's an international, so I'm going to open out the university black box, the um, international policy context that's evolving around that, what academics actually do, as opposed to the practice, as opposed to the policy, something about the role of the university in the leadership of place, and then end up with something from the Civic University Commission, um, and, the, uh, and particularly the Civic University Agreements, which is one of our uh, policy recommendations. And I've just got one side on, on, on Newcastle. I'm not going to do a lot on Newcastle. Okay, I think the first point is, and building on that, is the notion that there are two separate knowledge and policy communities working here. There is the people who are interesting, like I was, in the city, in city and regional development, backed into the university as an institution for tackling some of the challenges confronting cities. On the other side, there's a whole body and, and, and the, 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 the governance body, the, the policy domain around that tends to be people who are interested in city development, um, you know, ministries and so on responsible for cities, and to a lesser degree those responsible for innovation. And then the other body of knowledge and research is those people who study the university as an object of study and are the policy makers around. And these two communities are totally separate. And I've spent most of my uh, past 20 years straddling both of those worlds. And it's really quite challenging. You try and put a research proposal into a, a research program on, on higher education with a city development, you'll get knocked out of the research grant application by the people who are the specialists in higher education research. <laughs> and most of the people who are interested in city and regional development, they will poo-poo the role of the universities. It's very interesting. Okay, what I've done, I've written two books, looking into the university from the city. Um, this is a book really, it's an outside-in perspective, um, with the focus on the role of the universities in addressing the challenges of the environmental sustainability, health and cultural development and we did some case studies of, 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 of English cities. Um, and then, uh, then we took, an, the next book I did was an inside out perspective. So the, the, this is the one that, so these go to those two policy communities. Series of case studies of eight cities, the focus is on the what and how of civic engagement. Particularly the vision, mission, leadership, management, governance, organization, human resources, and how do you mobilize the academy, and motivate the academy, to work with their cities and communities? So that's the, the second book, and I'm going to summarize some of the findings. What has, uh, the, the language, and it is, I agree, and I could give you a whole lecture on the language of anchor institutions, but it's become, and, and, and frankly, I think we did coin it in, in, the, in the first book, the notion of the university as an anchor institution. It's a concept that is quite helpful in bridging these two separate worlds. Um, so uh, anchor institutions, this is a definition which was 
originally developed by the Work Foundation. Anchor institutions are large, locally embedded institutions, typically non-governmental, public sector, cultural, other institutions that are significant importance to the economy and, and I underline the and, the wider community life in which the, in which the, which, uh, of the cities in which they're based. Two key phrases there, locally embedded and the economic and the social. And so how, does the, how do these two worlds come together? Um, and the classic example in the US is the discourse about what's called Eds and Meds um, a, 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 as the example. And so universities uh, do not have a democratic mandate. Not, our boards are not elected by, by the electorate. Um, regeneration is not a core function of universities. Uh, nevertheless, our scale, local root in this potentially, and community meetings are such that we can play a key role in local development and economic growth. Um, and a nice phrase here, in the context of the global econ uh, globalization of the economy and society, we are still place sunk investment in our particular places. The scale of that is significant. So what does anchoring imply for university? Well, it implies relationships with other institutions that inhabit the city. Secondly, normative questions about the need for academic practice, research and citizen teaching to be relevant to the place in which the practitioners live and work as citizens. Now, that's, a, that's quite a loaded phrase, because I used to, when I was DVC, go round to the academy and say, what does it mean to you in terms of your, your research and teaching to be a citizen of Newcastle? Well, I hadn't really thought about that. So this notion that you are a citizen as an academic of place is, is quite an important. Thirdly, exploration of more broadly conceived territorial development process than just economic growth and competitiveness. Most of the stuff about universities and cities has been about the economic impact, the jobs generated, um, economic competitiveness. Um, but you, it's not just only about that. It's also issues about social inclusion, community engagement. And lastly, in thinking about anchoring, you have to think about the physical imprint, you know, the, the buildings. It's just been an interesting uh, experience this morning going to Olympia. I'm very interested in your science and innovation district. And social and cultural relations. And you can't separate the economic and the social, the built environment, the social and cultural. They're all interconnected. But there are tensions here. Let's start with the normative question. Fantastic paper way back in 2010 in the top scientific journal called Nature, where they wrote this piece, editorial, why do so many scientists ignore the needs of our cities? Researchers who benefit the from the opportunities that you ask, what can they give back? That was stunning in my university. Many of the scientists said, hang on, wait a minute. Um, this was quite useful. This was their journal saying you're benefiting all the externalities, the, the vitality of the cities. What do you give back to it? Um, very interesting. And the reason why there's not much in, uh, why academics by and large, many particular research intentions, universities, turn their backs on the cities, is this quote from Craig Calhoun, who was the director of the London School of Economics. We treat our opportunity to do research not as a public trust, but as a reward for success in past studies. Rewards for research are deeply tied up with the production of academic hierarchy and the relative standing in universities. Of institutions. So the whole hierarchy of, of, of universities, just a little anecdote, um, going to Mrs. Thatcher, the, the REF was introduced by Mrs. Thatcher, um, a, a Ken Baker, who was a, 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 um, a Minister of Education. She wanted to classify university into art research, RX research and teaching, and teaching on institutions. Um, and Ken Baker says, you don't need to do this from the top down. Leave it to the academics. She wanted a hierarchy of institutions. The academics will produce it for you. And we did it. <laughs> we produced the hierarchy through the ref um, and all the resource allocation that goes with it. So we do it. So we're guilty. Um, but public support for universities is based on the effort to educate citizens in general, to share knowledge, to distribute as widely as possible in accordance with publicly articulated purposes. Pretty important. It's in a journal called Thesis 11. And if you know your marks, you'll know what that thesis is about. Okay? And very interesting, more recent book is John Brewer's, um, who's in Belfast, book on the public value of the social sciences. Um, um, the use of the adjective public, public not only implies fundamental questions about accountability, but also poses additional queries about whom we, as social scientists, would feel accountable. Public social sciences, both the research and teaching agenda, research and teaching, 
and involves a commitment to promote the public good through civic engagement. So this is a challenge to the social scientists amongst us. But if you go and look at the literature, which we, I've reviewed, and, and, and there's papers about all this in the books, there's a quite a deal of tensions in that. There's a lot of emphasis on the, the, the economic impact of the university. Those are the ones of money spent by universities with consultants saying how many jobs we generated, and what's the economic impact of, of the... Uh, and that is an important element, but it's largely passive. We just happen to be here. Um, versus an active engagement in the development of the city. To what extent is the university an active player in the development, just not a passive player? An economic versus more holistic views of engagement with civil society. Community development, social inclusion, urban governance, health and well-being, uh, and cultural life. So those are important holistic views. That has to be in the ambit. And the last bullet point, which you see in the literature I've already referred to, is the external role of the, of the civic role of the university. These are the internal processes within the university. And particularly, universities are mesmerised by state policies. So we talked over lunch about the role of the Scottish Funding Council, issues of uh, research England and the rest. Those are the systems. Um, and so we are in those particular silos. But there's other sets of si uh, agendas uh, which are equally important. I like this quote. It was the first book ever on the university in the city uh, by Thomas Bender. And I think it's important that we understand we don't lose the identity of the university as an institution within the city. He proposes that we understand the university as semi-cloistered heterogeneity in the midst of uncloistered heterogeneity, that is, the, say, the city, Jane Jacobs and all that. Because of this difference, relationships between the two are necessarily tense and they cannot be assimilated into one another. To do so either practically or conceptually is to empty each of its distinctive cultural meaning and falsify the sociology of each. So you, what we're saying is we've got two entities, the city and the university. They are distinct, but they are, are how you intertwine them is really very challenging. So elaborating on these themes, um, the university is an institution and a set of academic subgroups. Most research, research intensive universities like this one are loosely coupled organisations. The role of physical sites and regeneration projects, which we've been talking about today, um, in, in facilitating or inhibiting university economic and community engagement in the city. There are some science parks around the world which are basically um, not in, at all uh, uh, facilitating this uh, uh, boundary between the university. How you physically design these things is critically important. Interinstitutional relationships between multiple universities and other HEIs, especially in large cities. We've had an interesting discourse here this morning about the, the universities in this city and, and how they're working together or not for the broader benefit of the city. The interdisciplinarity of many urban challenges and the institutional tensions with existing disciplinary-based academic structures. So if you take an example like an age-friendly city or a sustainable city, those by definition are transdisciplinary, but we still sit in most universities in disciplinary silos. Next, the role of intermediate organisations inside or outside the university in linking the university to the city. So I had a fantastic morning at the um, Olympia site, which seems to be a very good intermediate uh, structure um, and facilities that are in or off campus. And you have many universities inside the university really quite challenging structures, particularly technology transfer organisations that are wedded to a model, linear model of research commercialisation and relatively little support for the public engagement side. Lastly, the city and its various communities as collaborators or, which is often the case, passive sources of academic research, teaching and knowledge exchange. So how do we collaborate with the external stables in the co-production of knowledge? Okay, let's just unpack that a bit. Uh, place and community, these are four themes in, in, in the book, and I haven't got uh, time, the first book, uh, to un unpack all of these, but I'll just touch on some of them. Place and community, if you look at the history, it's really very important. I didn't realise that Glasgow University started off in the East End and moved into the city centre way back. I don't know how many people know that. Um, so you have to understand the history of institutions and the development of their campuses. Um, 
Um, and so we've got new university cities, you've had the suburbanization of campuses, or the spatial fragmentation of large cities. We have multiple campuses. I'm doing some work with Birmingham University, which is a campus university, broadly in the inner city, hasn't got a presence in the, in the city centre. And they, they acquired a building there which is going to be their hub. The traditional campus is a semi cloistered space in the midst of the city, dedicated to meeting the work and leisure needs of students and academic communities. It is very, very interesting. All the money that's been invested as a result of fees in UK university campus for competitive advantage has largely been internally orientated. Um, you know, how do you make it a nice place for the students to come uh, and creating a sort of almost a separate world. But there are pressures from public authorities to open out the campus to the city. Um, and where the university estates department is operating all this is extremely interesting. Uh, because they have their own dynamic, they do the estates. Once you start building buildings, I can tell you, because we've built a big science centre, buildings get their own logic, and the o organisational processes um, are, you know, are really quite challenging. And I was pleased to learn that there is a joint arrangement between my, the State Department in my university and the State Department in Glasgow University, <coughs> who are sharing experience, I've only just found out about that, on how to do this sort of stuff. Um, and what quite often happens is universities want some extra money, so they go to urban regeneration companies to get some money to do what they want to do, rather than what the urban regeneration companies want. So there's some quite tricky issues about how external funding is used in this domain. And I threw this slide in because I do think um, it's from, um, uh, from MIT, because part of the whole issue... Um, and I have my colleague, George, George Arvana, who was in, uh, uh, she's in planning and landscape in Newcastle, was here. Um, the whole design of university campuses is critically important in how you can get these different groups to come together, how your buildings are open to the outside world, and all of it, this is from MIT, co-authorship, proximity matters. So actually how people get together, not only within the academy, but with the outside world. How we design build, buildings that are open to the outside world. And so I could go on at length about that. Then, just a little bit about urban innovation. Um, this is pretty well known, I guess. But basically the shift from mode one, linear to mode two, pre-production of knowledge, and open innovations raises important opportunities for relations with local actors in the city. So if you want to contribute to innovation, you need to work, do some work with your local communities. Um, and it implies the university, multiple functions of the university, as a, an, an education and cultural institution, not just a knowledge producer. So I've been asking questions of my colleagues today in, in, in Glasgow. How does the work you're doing get embedded in the teaching and learning programs of the university? And we've uncovered a whole set of very interesting things about master's dissertations, of students working with community groups as part of their master's programs. Joining up the direct commodification of knowledge via spin outs which tends to be the focus of much of this stuff, with human capital development and labour market, the skills agenda, broadly speaking. Um, we haven't touched on, on, on that a lot, but actually how do you get, uh, if you have innovations in the productive sphere, are you skilling the people up to make use in, those, in local companies of those technologies? Um, and also, very important this, the, cap, uh, the social capital that builds trust and cooperative norms in local governance networks. What we've observed in many uh, studies that I've done of universities is these trust-based relationships take a long time to build. What tends to happen, projects are funded, they're fixed term, you go in, you do some work with communities and business, then you pull out again. Um, and so this whole notion of building sustainable partnership raises fundamental questions about how these sustainable relationships are funded. And this relates to what is sometimes in the literature called not just the de generative role of the university in generating new knowledge, even with partners, but the developmental role of the university as a civic institution. Its influence on the political, institutional and network factors that shape innovation processes beyond the narrow definition of knowledge capital. And I think this university is, uh, I'm going to flatter him now, very fortunate to have someone doing that sort of stuff in what DES does. You know, you'll, you have someone who can walk between all of these worlds as an interlocutor uh, in, in developing uh, this broader uh, perspective. 
And why this is all important, because the way we're innovating is changing. This is a Mickey Mouse slide from Nesta from a time ago. But basically, uh, we're going from one model of innovation uh, through to one we have user innovation, innovations in services, social innovation, and open. There's a lot of language about that. I could give you a whole lecture about this. But just a few headlines. Open innovation is, an, is, is no longer a new paradigm based on a quadruple helix model where government, industry, academia, and civil participants work together to co-create the future and drive structural changes far beyond the scope of what any one organization or person could do alone. So not just the university, not just the local government, not just business, not just citizens group, but the lot working together. This model encompasses a user-oriented innovation process to take advantage of ideas, cross-fertilization, leading to experiments, trying things out, you have the what works sent here, and prototyping in a world world setting. That captures the sort of thing which I think is going on here uh, uh, in, in, in a bit of maybe jargon. I'm, uh, I'm going to skip this. And the other thing that comes up in the, in the literature is social innovation. Um, the innovation that both social in their ends and means, new ideas, products, services, and models in the way in which services are delivered, particularly in the, in the health area, that simultaneously meets social needs more effective than others, and create new social relations or collaborations. So this whole notion of working together um, participatively um, to solve a social challenge and empowers the actors to work together. Um, uh, this is a in very interesting slide. There's a huge discourse out there in innovation literature um, about the, the death of the linear model. Um, and this is n a lovely critique. Our innovation economy is not a Roman aqueduct, but a muddy pond. It requires all actors, corporate, academic, civil, and political. So this report, uh, European report, is, has been quite influential in thinking of, of how the, uh, the, the European Commission operates in this space. And much of this, and again I haven't got time to read this slide, you cannot think about all of this now without thinking how digital technology is changing the way in which we work with external stakeholders. Um, it's, it's fundamental. Um, most of the citizens out there have access to, 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 to smartphones, uh, even the most deprived people. And so the whole mechanism about how innovations spread, WhatsApp, all the rest of it, um, and, and various apps of various sorts. And so we have a big group in Newcastle, of nearly 80 people, working on digital civics. How all of our relationships with schools, with, uh, um, with, with, with business, uh, with civil society organisation is increasingly being managed, not just by AI and big data, really pretty basic things. So that's an interesting, and I'm going to skip over this. Well, just a quick point about, we tend to see about the, this as a triple helix. High tech firms, university and public authorities, developing platforms, that's another bit of the language, the platforms by which these collaborations are supported. Um, and in a way, users and citizens are out there on, on the far right hand corner. Um, but the model which I'm particularly interested in is a civic citizen-centered quadruple helix model, where citizens um, uh, are relevant co contribute to the whole innovation process. And a very interesting example that I heard this morning is about um, citizens coming, citizens groups coming to the university with projects where they wanted research carried on. I can't remember which group it was. It was a very interesting idea. That the citizens come in, you then get the firms involved, you get the universities and the public authorities. And this whole idea of uh, the main goal of innovation act to produce products and services relevant for citizens. Innovations relevant for citizens and, the, and they are part of the co-production process. Um, so now coming to opening out the university black box. If you read the literature, the academic literature of the universities, you get uh, these sorts of things. The entrepreneurial university became compulsory reading for every vice chancellor when they were appointed. Um, and it was taught on the, uh, the development program for the Leadership Foundation. You had to read Burton Kark. With a strengthened steering core, enhanced development periphery, a diversified funding base, and a stimulated academic heartland. That was the model. You had to build that model into how you run the university. Then it was the academic capitalist model, uh, which was a critical social science version of all of that, where the faculty were out there uh, earning pots and pots of money, behaving like entrepreneurs with a tenured position, 
turning up with BMWs and whatever and parking on the university campus. Um, so that was that model. And then there was a triple helix model um, produced by en en Henry Eptivitz, and this is the dominant paradigm that is backed by treasuries, by governments all across the world. There's a global network called the Triple Helix Association, um, and broadly speaking, the focus is on science, technology, and business, and a neglect of the humanities and social sciences and place com uh, communities and civil society. So my book was written basically as a critique of this particular model. Um, and we look at the traditional university, and it looks like this. You have teaching and research in two totally separate domains. PVC for teaching, PVC for research, and then third mission, which is by definition an inferior mission, because it's third. Um, and lots and lots of activities going on out there with community groups, below the radar screens of senior management, acting out there, people doing stuff, um, and the focus of leadership and management is teaching satisfaction scores. How do you turn up in the Guardian rankings? The research rankings, the QS rankings. And the role of management, third mission is about earning money. Uh, how do you earn money? You know, new research grants and contracts, commercializations and spin-outs. And there's a pretty hard boundary between the university and the external world. That's your classic Ivory Tower University. And most universities, traditional universities, still look like that. Um, and what that's linked with, and some work we did for the OECD and the, uh, for the European Commission, actually, we did some work for the OECD and then we codified that in Connected to Universities to Regional Growth. Um, we went around Europe doing lots and lots of stuff. Um, and broadly speaking, in many parts of Europe, Higher education was in the region, but not of it. Their policies and practice discouraged engagement. The focus on rewards for academic research and teaching. But equally, there are problems in many places about the public sector. It, it didn't really have adequate political leadership. It really didn't understand higher education. And the private sector was well, poorly articulated, dominated by firms with lo low demand, absorption. Many of European regions look like that. Completely, and into that, lots of European funding was tipped and uh, called smart specialization. It's been a disaster. Um, and critically, what we observed were very few people acting as boundary spanners between these three worlds. There was a focus on supply side transactional interventions, ineffective or non existent partnerships, lack of a shared understanding about the challenges, and entrepreneurs locked out of the regional planning process. So we have an alternative model, which is in my book and which has really taken off, which is called the Civic University, where all those little projects out there that were being done externally as third mission activities get embedded into the core activities of teaching and research. And engagement, and there's still some things that are outside engagement, there's still things that are pure teaching, things that are still pure research, but it's how you bring the whole lot together. So teaching, all the discussions about widening participation and community work through student community action. This is big stuff, student community action. Oh, you can't graduate from a, me a Mexican university without 400 hours of community service. service. It's very interesting. So Latin America has done this extremely well. Um, how research and teaching enhance each other, and that often is, isn't the case. Um, how research has socioeconomic impact, and we have a big discussion about that, we can do. Um, but the emphasis on management is transformative, responsive, and demand-led action. How can we respond to the needs and challenges of our communities? Um, and how can we create a soft boundary between the university and the outside world? Uh, between the academy and society. So that's the heart of what our civic university model. And if that works, you will get a connected region. Um, all sorts of things there, some of which you're doing here. Um, analysis and evidence and intelligence for planning, skills development, commercialization research, building the infrastructure. So that's the how we want to get to, and evidence-based uh, policies that support smart innovation and growth. So in the book, we identify, in the appendix of the book, there is a toolkit for making an assessment of how far your university is uh, it going down this route. And we have seven dimensions of the civic university. Sense of place, active engagement, a holistic approach, sense of purpose, 
a willingness to invest in this, it costs money, transparency and accountability, and innovative methodology. And all of those are important, and I can't have time to go through them. But what we do, if you look at the appendix of the book, we ask universities to recognise if you really want to come to the idealist model, ideal model of the civic university embedded, um, universities ha have to go on an, a journey. You just can't do this overnight. It's a process of institutional change. Um, and you take a series of steps. And so we ask universities to assess where they are on this journey. Um, and it's, it's not a, a get a gold star, like the many people are probably aware we're, we're nervous about the KEF, the, the College Exchange Framework. They'll do the same as they've done with the TEF. You'll get a, you'll get a gold star for your, your engagement. Um, we're not really about that. So just one of the dimensions, the sense of place, to what extent, and if you ask, you know, Glasgow could ask these questions. Um, is the location of the institution uh, in integral to it, its identity, the University of Glasgow? What does that of mean? It is viewed as an important asset by the local community. How many people in Glasgow, you went out in the, into the community and said, uh, do you see Glasgow University as a, a contribution to your life and to your community? It physically bends within the local built environment, not separate, and is seen as a living laboratory for research. So that's the ideal position. Most universities are in various points along that spectrum. Um, and I, we, there are, in the book, there are scales for all of these. What is critical for all of this, and this is quite challenging, this is not a description of how universities actually operate. You can go out and collect empirical work and study how they're happening. This is a normative model, and this is challenging. This is what we should aim to be. Not only in excellent in terms of conventional academic criteria, but also seeking to contribute to the public good. My previous vice chancellor, Chris Brank, South African, used to walk around the university and say to the academics, we went into departments, he says, I'm interested in not only what you are good at, that's the scientific agenda, what are you good for? What are you good at and what are you good for? It's quite a challenging issue for the academy. This is not a new agenda, but it's given greater saliency in the fight of the challenges facing society. Um, and at the same time, universities have to respond to these rankings. You can't get good academics to come to you unless you're highly ranked. So you, we are in a globally competitive higher education market. Right? So we've got to try and manage those, those conflicts between the higher education world and our civic responsibilities. Um, and that's really quite challenging because governments do tend to grab certain things. So the British Treasury thinks if we pump lots of money upstream into science, it'll get downstream societal benefits um, and business benefits. That's plainly not true. It hasn't happened. I mean, we can argue about it, but that's where they come from. And many local authorities, quite frankly, say pump more money into our universities and we will get on the map. We'll get lots of scientists who want to come here. We'll generate passive economic impacts. That is common. Um, and doing all of this, designing the civic university, is a really challenging process. Um, you need to have some general principles matched by an intentionally wide scope for bottom-up creativity and entrepreneurship. So many universities have suffered in the, 19, in the 2000s by the introduction of new public management, which have mechanisms of reward, key performance indicators, in our surveys, what we found, there were many academics, universities that had civic engagement up there as a, a general principle. Lots of academics were doing it down there as part of their uh, below the radar screens, but when it came to resourcing, the dead stop was middle management. Because middle management was driven by bums on seats uh, and papers in, science, in, in scientific journals. So this whole agenda was often stopped in universities by middle managers. And what you need in a, in a truly civic university is a combination of top down and bottom up. To so say, we encourage you to do it and we support it, um, and we put resources behind it, and you do need some pretty deep institutional change. Um, and, uh, and really a bit, bit of disruptive change. And I'm not entirely sure if you can always do it incre incrementally. Um, but there we go, we can have a discussion about that. What do academics do? I always put this slide in because so much of the conversation about universities and engagement is around commercialization. 
This is a survey of 22,000 academics about how many, what percentage did the following things. Very few do the commercialization stuff. Very few. Um, they do lots of problem solving, informal advice. The people who kill off innovation, by the way, oh, I hope we've approved some people from your, your, your uh, technology transfer office. The people who often kill it off are the people who say, we want to you know, make sure that you're going to get a license or you're going to get a, uh, some granting come out of it. And they kill off some of these informal relationships. Community-based activities, a lot of stuff that academics do. So there's a lot of stuff going on out there uh, which is relevant to this agenda. But loosely, it's not recognised as such. Um, and I, I like this. I always include this slide uh, from one of our leading academics um, because, in a way, I want more and more academics in my university to spontaneously think like this guy. The notion of treating our city and its region as a seedbed for... He was director of an institute for sustainability. As a seedbed for sustainability is a potent one. The vision is academics out in the community working with local groups and businesses on practical initiatives to solve problems and promote sustainable development and growth. That necessitates that we proceed in a very open manner, seeking to overcome barriers to thought, action and engagement. Barriers between researchers and citizens, between the urban and the rural, between the social and natural sciences, between teaching, research and enterprise. He said that spontaneously in an interview. And I just think that's, you know, more people, you go out now, are you thinking like that? And one of the, and I'm now going to say something about how you can do something about this. As an interesting academic at, at, at Bristol called Robin Hamilton, a brilliant book, has written about the leadership of place. And he talks about political leadership, politicians, um, managerial leadership, executives of local government, and community leaders, community leadership groups. And then he puts the top of that, some what quite distinctive, which is what we can offer. It's intellectual leadership. And how do you translate intellectual leadership into the, into the place? And one of the ways we've done this in Newcastle is through uh, a program called Newcastle City Futures, um, anchoring universities in cities through urban foresight. Massive, bringing the academics out in different disciplines to say, what is your discipline, your knowledge relevant to the long-term future of the city? So we had people from medical science, from engineering, from social sciences, thinking about long-term futures. Um, and it was a very instructive exercise. Because in the foresight process, users, universities and cities can identify assets and opportunities, sharing data, new insights, developing systems thinking across fragmented governance structures, networking. And so Newcastle City Futures was a very powerful catalytic influence in, in Newcastle. And it involved ca capacity building, and I'm going to skip that side. Now, I'm now going to run out of the next 10 minutes to say something about uh, the, the policy context here and now in the UK. I started this journey uh, soon after I retired. I was asked by Nesta to write a provocation. And I wrote it in called Reinventing the Civic University. Um, that was recognising that many of our great British universities, like Newcastle, Sheffield, um, um, Manchester, Birmingham, were created to meet the needs of the economy and society in the 19th century. So they were born out of place, funded by local communities, subscriptions by local people. And it was apparent to me that many of those universities, including my own, had, during the, uh, the, the 2000s and the 1990s, turned their base. They were, they were nationalised. You know, most were nationalised and turned their back on the city. So I wrote a provocation saying, can we reinvent the civic university? But that was a specific subset of universities, um, i.e. those that had their foundation. But we have a big and complex system, higher education system there. And that, that higher education system has evolved in the UK without any planning at all. Higher education has developed in a totally unplanned way. It's where places have come up, so you've got a university, the, the present structure, the low, large number of campuses created because Tony Blair wanted participation rates to go to 50%. And the only way to do it was setting up lots of new universities all over the place. Cumbria, Chester, blah, blah, blah Highlands and Islands. So there was endless... But the consequences of that massive expansion without much planning, when you then introduce a marketplace into that system with unevenly um, resourced institutions, some quite weak, um, uh, with an external environment changing, is that there are risks a system shakes out. 
And this is a survey that's done every year by PA Consulting um, of, of Vice Chancellors, uh, asking opinion survey, it's not a database thing. Um, and 47% in 2008 said uh, that institutional failures and closures were quite possible um, and 12% likely. Overall shrinking of provision and choice, takeovers and mergers, uh, greater stratification, um, and really a really quite challenging environment, largely introduced by the Higher Education Act, which was passed uh, in, recently. And, th and this is a quote from them. I think it's quite important that we understand this, because it's, gonna, it's a lot about what's going on at the present time. The sectors at a pivotal point, the very strong are getting stronger, while the very weak are under considerable threat. Those in the middle are trying to figure out whether to twist, twist, stick or twist. There could be carnage. The expectations that some failures seemed inevitable were tempered by the observation that many of the issues known to be in difficulty from falling numbers and mounting losses were located in disadvantaged towns and cities where their closure would be politically and economically disastrous, notwithstanding the government's rhetoric of institutions exiting the system. So the Act allows universities to leave. Um, so there's some really big and, and challenging issues um, around all that. Um, and I like this quote because Mike Boxall, who was a, was a consultant, wrote, worked with that report, did this piece in the Tire, Tire Education. I think it does speak to the civic university agenda. If we do not think about fundamental institutional transformation, some universities, and indeed many, even bigger universities, are under severe threat. We have to think about deep-seated change. And he says, um, they must rise above the interests of their own standalone institutions to go their roles of universities with interdependent systems of learning providers, businesses, public agents and communities working together to resolve shared needs and platforms. So the issue is, for Glasgow, how the various FE and HE institutions can work together in a way to meet the demands of the society. Now I'm going to end up with a few words about and it was in the, that context, broadly speaking, institutional failures um, in the context of the Act that the Civic University Commission was set up. Um, there was a genuine concern in, in government that um, this Act had been introduced, um, driven by Joe Johnson, Boris's brother, um, driven through the House of Lords, um, with very little regard to what the consequences of the further marketization would be, particularly the place-based consequences of it. Um, and the civil servants warned ministers of this, that they created the Office of Students. The Office of Students in, in England at least has no powers to bail out institutions. It's a competition regulator. You've had the complete separation of the research side in UKRI. There is no longer in England a unified Funding Council for Higher Education. So this really been quite. So this was the context of setting this uh, this uh, commission up. So the context was the post 2008 crash, uh, which produced austerity and the massive increase in fees. So we had the situation where universities post it from about 2010 onwards had pots and pots of money, pots and pots of money. Um, compared to local government was facing austerity. And so local, local government was saying, what are you guys doing? Why are you building all these student halls of residences? Modernizing you. So the only cranes on the skyline in many cities in, in England were university cranes. You've got widening socioeconomic disparities, left behind people and left behind places, Brexit and populism, and, and the citizens out there, you just have to read the Daily Mail and the popular press, and, and Michael Goh's comment about we've had enough of experts um, and universities and experts were seen as part of the problem by leavers and Brexiteers. Vice Chancellor's salaries and the university's perceived espousal of left-wing causes was, is in the press all the time. It's the same in the US. So populism, the universities are regarded very poorly by the, the electorate. Um, we are seen to be part of the evils of globalisation and that have undermined communities. We, we are seen for international institutions and, and we lobbied, fatal, fatal mistake, universities lobbied to remain on grounds of narrow self-interest. We want European research institutes. So you look at the submissions to a uh, web come up, we, we did not think about the notion of the public good, how Europe was important, and uh, all sorts of other reasons. So we are, our, 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 our reputation out there with the electorate 
including an electoral system which is place-based. Okay? It's just it's important. Our electoral system is place-based. And if we're going to get support politicians, we need to have place-based support for universities. Um, I've already talked about this, the Higher Education Act. Um, uh, then what kicked it all into t uh, and stirred it up again was the Labour pledge to abolish charges and fees leading to the Orga Review. Um, the consequence of the Orga Review, I don't understand exactly how that will play out in Scotland, uh, I haven't done enough thinking about that, but the Orga Review is in England is mean that many universities who do put money into public good will stop spending it on it because, you know, it will, it will just disappear. Um, and, and, and there's lots of evidence coming out from that. The other thing is the ONS review of, of student debt, which was off the balance sheet, is now on the balance sheet. So student debt is no longer off balance, it's in public expenditure. So half of university funding comes from the state, means that universities will have to compete for public funding and just, uh, well, justify what they do in return, not least for their community. So now, going forward, we'll increasingly be re competing with the health service. Um, we have the capability, opportunity and responsibility to respond to local needs, not least to cure. So it's a passive of self-interest, but we do have a moral commitment. Um, so we need our places and our places need us. So what we did in this report, um, very quickly, focus groups, panel surveys, written evidence, oral evidence in cities, Bob Kerslake or Kerslake run it like a select committee going outside Parliament. We, we had a number of themes, industrial strategy, internationalization, health and well-being and culture. I chaired an academic round table, getting academic ideas into it, um, and we, we noticed very clearly how the way in which cities were governed, most of the involving governance structure, universities sit in, in England in totally different, some are in um, combined authorities with the mayor, some are only in districts, some, it, it is a mess. So the, the, the context is really quite problematic. Um, and these are some of that come from our focus group. If I was paying all of that money, I'd want to spend on me, not on other people in the city. This is individual populations talking to us. Universities are now just another corporate entity there to make a pro profit. They come, they study, they party, they go. Um, institutions offer, often suffer from a failure to listen. Too often social action programs are delivered without listening to local key, act key local actors need and gaining understanding of the needs of the local area. Um, so what did we find? In our work, and this is some conclusions from our report, the lack of local accountability of universities to their cities. There was an ignorance of local people about the contribution universities made to their communities, especially, especially amongst the less advantaged. Fees for individual students were for, for their benefit. Me, 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 not the public good. Lots of bottom-up engagement activity, but a lack of strategic intent space, intent based on analyzing and meeting needs of people who grow up live and work locally, including for lifelong learning. Short-term project funding, uh, which I've already mentioned, mitigates long, that long-term trust and collaborative partnerships. National funding silos, from uh, for a Strength in Places Fund, um, UKRI, etc., etc. Um, and each of these different funding streams having their own metrics associated with them, um, which creates all sorts of problems. Um, so how do universities need to change to be truly civic universities? First, adoption of a holistic engagement and play strategy, co-created with partners in the public, private and voluntary sectors, and other local post-18 educational providers, including procedures for public accountability. How are we together accountable to our publics? How do we tell them what we're doing and listen to them? Clear internal processes for connecting teaching, Research, internationalization, and civic education at the executive board level. That's my civic university model. An institutional framework supports, recognizes, and rewards bottom-up civic engagement, and recognizes as part of normal business 
including, very important including, the work of professional services. Quite often the professional services are in one box, the academics are in another box, and there isn't a career structure for those who boundary, b b b go across the two worlds. These are blended professionals in finance, estates, communications, working with a research hub connecting to the global discourse on universities in place and like-minded institutions. So that's what we're trying to get, create. The locality of the site for the co-creation of knowledge and a quote living laboratory. Lots of things we could discuss about that. And the establishment of place-based university foundations to support local good actions. That's a very important point. What is emerging in, in taking this forward, we need to look at the ch charitable the foundations and charitable giving as an important source of funding for this type of activity. Um, and we have a series of tests in the report, a public test, a place test, a strategic test. Um, I'm going to skip over that. We have a series of recommendations. The most important was the Civic University Agreement. Um, and I'm just going to end by saying something about the Civic University Agreement because this university has signed up for it. A Civic University Agreement, 53 VCs, including Anton Muscatelli, have committed... Um, a civic university agreement should enshrine their analysis and strategy so that it's co-created and signed by key partners. Understanding local populations and asking what they want from the university. Understanding themselves. You know, how are we doing this? How, how are we organised? How is it resourced? How are we, how are we mobilising ourselves internally? Mir mirrors for ourselves. Working with other local institutions, business and community organisations to agree where the short-term, medium and long-term opportunity lies in a given area. And that area could be quite small, um, or it could be multiple areas. A clear set of priorities. You can't do everything. What are the priorities now? What are the priorities? So you have to bite it off a, a step at a time. The output of all the strategic analysis, local, local engagement prioritisation, will be a clear action plan. Part of this will be a funding plan. How are we going to resource all of that um, is critically important. So what we're doing right now, just to be completely up to date, um, we've established the Civic University Christian, a group of policy makers and practitioners from inside and outside of higher education, local government association, NHS, Arts Council, etc. I'm chairing this group, um, looking at uh, developing a framework, a national including uh, 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 Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, a framework for civic agreements. We've done an online survey of all the signatories covering the preparation of CEOs. How, how are you going about doing it? I think Des has filled it in for you. I hope he has. Um, and we're doing in-depth interviews with a selection of universities. We have a consulted consultation forum to which all universities who signed are in being invited at UUK on July the 19th. And we're going to develop scope, a support hub to share knowledge and facilitate peer review uh, between universities. And finally, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there about how to do this, and this is one I've just picked on. Um, it's a, an Institute for Voluntary Action Research. Very interesting piece of work. How, how do you actually do this? What are the tools out there? There are lots of tools out there and how you do this collaborative stuff. And this is an interesting one. It's called the Institute for Voluntary Action Research. I only discovered it over the weekend. Um, um, what does place mean? Why are you considering or using a place-based approach? What contributes? It's a, it's a set of questions, um, which I think we need some tools. And this, is going to inf this sort of work is what's going to inform our framework. Finally, um, just in, from a Scottish perspective, we're trying to embrace the whole of the UK. Um, and it's quite interesting what's going on in Wales. Um, I've been did a report for the Welsh government through the Wales Centre of Public Policy, which is sort of a bit similar to, to your network here. Maximising the university's civic contribution, the whole set of guidelines there, which is now being new, taken up by the Welsh government. Um, and the key, just our key recommendations, and there might be some case for sharing experiences between Wales and Scotland, as much and much what I've been talking about has mainly been England. Um, develop a strategic vision for the post-compulsory education and training system. That's the whole system, including lifelong learning. Using institutional compacts as a vehicle for promoting civic engagement, i.e. the state gives a compact to a university and saying, we will give you funding for this, providing these are things you're going to deliver. Not formula, it's a compact. That's huge. Compacts are widely used in other countries. We eschew them in this country. 
developing regional clusters of institutions as key enablers of regional development. So clusters of institutions in, 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 in Glasgow City region. So linking links across the whole system as an, in, an issue of access and access and providing seed funding. Finally, and it's my last slide, is Newcastle University. Um, this is where we are at now. We have a, a, a place and engagement strategy um, as part of our vision. Um, so the, the four pillars of our institutional strategy are education for life, research and discovery for impact, surrounded by engagement and place and global, because this is a global issue. So those are the four values, the principles, and we have now appointed a Dean of Engagement and Place um, about how to take this forward. And what I'm hoping to do is, and I haven't got time to show it, there's a video at the end if you've got time, um, how we're taking that agenda forward. So I'm very keen um, to see whether in my university, where we've been a bit of a pioneer in this, we can begin to share experience with the impressive range of things that you're doing here. Thank you very much. Oh.